IELTS listening is one of the most challenging sections in the IELTS test. In this video, we're going to run through a whole IELTS listening practice test so you know what to do on test day. We'll start by looking at a complete overview of the listening test. I'll then talk you through the different sections of the test so that you're familiar with the format. And finally, we'll practice each part of the listening test together and I'll give you a few tips on how to answer the questions. Okay, let's start with an overview of the IELTS listening test. There are four sections. In section one, you'll hear two people having a conversation. Section two will usually be a single person giving instructions. Section three is also a conversation, but with more people and also in an academic context. Finally, in section four, you'll hear one person giving an academic lecture. The test takes about 30 minutes in total. This includes time to read the questions before you listen to each section and time to check your answers. The audio recordings and the questions get more difficult as you progress through the test. There is also time before each section to read the questions and time after each section to check your answers. This is what the answer sheet looks like. If you want, you can download this answer sheet from the description of this video and type answers in as you watch. The answer sheet also includes extra questions that you can practice after this video. Download them for free by clicking the link in the description. Let's start our practice with section one of the IELTS listening test. This is a form completion question. We'll hear two people in conversation discussing a form that they need to complete. Always read the instructions. They're printed in bold capital letters because they're important. Read everything so you understand the context. Predict the kind of information that you'll be listening for. For example, we can see that question two will be a time. Be careful of distractors. They might say something like, the run used to be six kilometers, but now it's seven. The answer would be seven, not six. For question seven, they're going to spell out Pete's family name. They nearly always spell names because they're not common words. Get ready to listen out for English letters of the alphabet. Okay, great. We've read the questions carefully and we've thought about the type of information that we're listening for. We're ready. Let's now listen to the audio and begin to answer the questions one to six. Try and answer them while the audio is playing. Feel free to take extra time if you need to. Let's listen. Good morning, Dave Smith speaking. Hi, could I speak to the organizer of the Camberwell Park Run? Yes, that's me. Great. I was talking to some friends of mine about the run and they suggested I contact you to get some more details. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, they said it takes place every Saturday. Is that right? Yes, it does. Okay, that's great. Do you know where the park is? Oh yes, I've been there before. But it's quite big and I'm not sure where to go. Well, there's a circular track that goes right around the park. The run starts in the cafe, goes past the tennis courts, then twice around the lake and finishes back where it started. OK. And what time is the run? Well, the actual run begins at 9am, but the runners start arriving at about 8.45. OK, so I need to get up early Saturday morning then. And how long is the run? Well, it used to be three kilometres, but most people wanted to do a bit more than that, so we lengthened it to five kilometres. We now go round the lake twice, and that adds an extra two kilometres. Right. Not sure I'd ever run that far, so I'd better start doing a bit of training. That's a good idea. But it's not a race. It's really just for fun, and the best thing would be to take it easy for the first few times you do it, and then see if you can gradually improve your time. Is the run time then? How do I know how well I've done? When you cross the finish line, you'll be given a barcode. And you can take this to one of the run volunteers who will scan it. Then you can get your time online when you go home. Oh, I see. You collect all the results. Exactly. I see. That's great. So how do I register? Well, there are several ways. I could take your details over the phone, but it's much easier if you do it using the website. OK, good. Um, I think that's probably all I need to know for now. Oh yes, does it cost anything to register or do you collect money each week? 
while it doesn't cost anything to register, but we do charge for the run. In fact, we have just increased the charge to $5. It used to be $2, but because we were making a bit of a loss, we had to increase it. Okay, thanks. I think I have enough information on taking part in the run. Okay, how are you going? Let us know in the comments. Let's now try to answer questions 7 to 10. Listen closely. You mentioned volunteers. I have a friend who is interested in helping out. Can you give me some details so I could pass them on to her? Sure. Well, you need to ask your friend to contact Pete Morn. He manages all the volunteers. Okay. I didn't quite catch his surname. Was it Morn? M-O-R-N? No, just a bit more complicated. It's M-A-U-G-H-A-N. Right. Thanks. And could you give me his phone number? Yes. Just a moment. It's here somewhere. Let me find it. I've got two numbers for him. I think the one that begins 01273 is an old one, so use this one. Call 014-447-3290. Okay, got that. Can you tell me anything about the volunteering? Like, what kind of activities it involves? Sure. Well, we need volunteers for basic stuff like setting up the course. We have to do that before all the runners arrive. Okay, so that's a really early start. Uh, yes, that's right. But if your friend would prefer to arrive a bit later, is she can also help with guiding the runners so they don't go the wrong way. I see. I believe you do a report on some of the races. Yes, that's right. In fact, we do a weekly report on each race and we always try to illustrate it. Okay. Well, my friend really likes taking photographs. She's just bought a new camera. Actually, that would be great. I don't know whether Pete has anyone to take photographs this week. Oh, I'll let her know. Okay, good. Uh, could you ask your friend to phone Pete and let him know? Yes, I will. Okay. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. How did you go? Let's have a look at the correct answers. Here they are. Number one is cafe. For number two, you can write the time as 9 a.m. or 9 o'clock, and you can write 9 as a number or a word. With number three, kilometers can be spelled the American or the British way. They're both correct. Or you can simply write km. For number four and five, Barcode and website can be one word or two words. Both are okay. The answer to question six is five. For the family name in number seven, make sure that you use a capital letter at the start. Notice how with some questions such as number 10, there is more than one correct answer. Remember you can download the answer sheet for free and work along with the video by clicking the link in the description below. Also included are extra listening practice questions. Okay, so that's exactly what section one is like on test day. Of course, the recording and questions are different in every test, but the type of questions is the same. Make sure to listen carefully for the information that's missing from the form and fill in the gaps. With practice and careful focused listening, you can do really well in section one. Let's move on to section two. In this part, you usually hear a single speaker giving instructions. Today we'll be practicing multiple choice questions and matching questions. We'll start by looking at multiple choice questions. The approach here is fairly simple. In part two of the test, the multiple choice questions are mostly going to be about details. The main thing to do here is to read the questions and note any key words that will help you focus. For number 11, I want to know where the idea came from. For 12, I need to find the unusual detail. For 13, what are they worried about? And 14, what decision has not been made? You should read the answers quickly and listen carefully to catch any synonyms that might reveal the answer. Now have a look at the other question type, matching. For questions 15 to 20, the main thing to understand is that the questions will come in the same order as the numbers, so for each question, listen, note which feature they talk about, and then select the appropriate letter. 
Let's now listen to the audio and begin to answer the questions 11 to 14, the multiple choice questions. Try and answer them while the audio is playing. Once again, feel free to take extra time if you need to. Let's listen. Good morning. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to say a little about two exciting new developments in the city, the Brackenside Open Air Swimming Pool and the Children's Adventure Playground in Central Park. As many of you may know, the idea for these initiatives came from you, the public, in the extensive consultation exercise which the City Council conducted last year, and they've been realized using money from the SWRDC, the Southwest Regional Development Commission. First of all, Brackenside Pool. As many of the older members of the audience will remember, there used to be a wonderful open-air pool on the seafront 30 years ago, but it had to close when it was judged to be unsafe. For the design of this new heated pool, we were very happy to secure the talents of internationally renowned architect Ellen Wenden, who has managed to combine a charming 1930s design, which fits in so well with many of the other buildings in the area, with up-to-the-minute features, such as a recycling system, the only one of its kind in the world, which enables seawater to be used in the pool. Now, there's been quite a bit of discussion in the local press about whether there would be enough room for the number of visitors we're hoping to attract. But the design is deceptive, and there have been rigorous checks about capacity. Also, just in case you were wondering, we are on schedule for a June 15th opening date and well within budget, a testimony to the excellent work of local contractors Hickman's. We hope that as many people as possible will be there on June 15th. We have engaged award-winning actress Coral White to declare the pool open, and there will be drinks and snacks available at the poolside. There will also be a competition for the public to decide on the sculpture we plan to have at the entrance. You will decide which famous historical figure from the city we should have. Great. Now let's try to answer questions 15 to 20, the matching questions. Listen closely. And now, moving on to the Central Park Playground, which we're pleased to announce has just won the Douglas Award for Safety. The news came through only last week. The unique design is based on the concept of the global village, with the playground being divided into six areas showing different parts of the world, each with a representative feature. For example, there's a section on Asia, and this is represented by rides and equipment in the shape of snakes, orangutans, tigers, and so on fauna native to the forests of the region. Moving south to the Antarctic, we couldn't run to an ice rink, I'm afraid, but opted instead for climbing blocks in the shape of mountains. I thought they could have had slides for the glaciers, but the designers did want to avoid being too literal. Then on to South America, and here the theme is El Dorado, games replicating the search for mines full of precious stones. And then moving up to North America, here, there was considerable debate. I know the contribution of cinema and jazz was considered, but the designers finally opted for rockets and the International Space Station. Eastwards to Europe, then, and perhaps the most traditional choice of all in the areas, medieval castles and other fortifications. Then last but not least, moving south to Africa and a whole set of wonderful mosaics and trails to represent the great rivers of this fascinating and varied continent. Now, the opening date for our global playground is the 10th of July. And again, we'd love to see you there. So make a date and come see this magnificent, original new amenity right in the heart of the city. How did you go? Let's have a look at the answers alongside the audio script. As always, if you want to hear the audio again, feel free to go back. For question 11, the speaker said, the idea for these initiatives came from you, the public. So that makes A the answer. Note that right after, there's a distractor. In fact, there are two distractors. They mention both the City Council and the SWRDC. Watch out. Sometimes you'll hear all three, but you need to pick the option that is directly connected to the question prompt. Moving on to question 12, this one also has two distractors, both of which come before the answer. You only hear the answer at the end of this part of the listening. So again, watch out. If you think you hear the answer, keep listening. They're trying to make sure that you're not just listening for words, but that you truly understand how the ideas connect together. For question 13, it's the same. 
Both A and B are mentioned, but they are not worries, so they don't complete the question stem. Question 14. In this case, they mention the statue at the door or the sculpture at the entrance. The others, A and B, are not mentioned. Let's have a look at the answers to the matching questions. Questions 15 to 20. For 15, they mention the animals in Asia and then the fauna native to its forests. Fauna, meaning the animals that live in that area, tells us that option E, local animals, is correct. And even if you don't understand this word fauna, the reference to snakes, orangutans, and tigers is a big clue. For 16, Antarctica, we hear that they chose climbing blocks in the shape of mountains. So F is correct. Moving on to 17, South America, we hear precious stones, a synonym for the word in option D, jewels. 18, North America. We hear that the designers chose rockets and the International Space Station, which makes H the correct answer. For 19, when they mention Europe, they talk about castles and fortifications, and so A is the right answer. And finally, for number 20, the speaker mentions Africa and the Great Rivers, making B, waterways, the correct answer. Remember to download the answer sheet and get access to more IELTS listening practice questions for free. Let's now move on to the next section, section three. In this section, you'll usually hear three people talking in a more academic context. Also, typically in section three, if you have multiple choice questions, they're going to be less detail oriented and instead will really test you on your ability to understand how the details relate to each other in a more meaningful way. Let's have a look. Here we have two questions and there are five answer options for each one. As always, read the instructions. Choose two letters A to E and read the questions. The first one is a bit easier. You need to identify two hobbies. But look at the second question. What are the two reasons why Heyerdahl went to live on the island? This question is testing your ability to understand cause and effect. The effect is that Heyerdahl goes to the island. What caused this? What are the reasons? Moving on to questions 25 to 30. Read each of the questions. What kind of information are you looking for? Note in question 25, we see the words due to, in 26, main reason, and 28, why. These questions are looking for cause and effect relationships. 27 and 29 are both looking at superlatives. We see the words most important and greatest influence. And finally, 30 is looking for a criticism or a reason people disagree. These are common question types you might see in section three of the listening test. Watch out, it will require you to follow ideas more carefully than in earlier sections of the test. Ready? Let's now listen to the audio and begin to answer the questions 21 to 24, the multiple choice, multiple answer questions. Try and answer them while the audio is playing. As always, feel free to take extra time if you need to. Let's listen. Right, well, for our presentation, shall I start with the early life of Thor Heyerdahl? Sure. Um, why don't you begin with describing the type of boy he was, especially his passion for collecting things? That's right. Uh, he had his own little museum, and I think it's unusual for children to develop their own values and not join in their parents' hobbies. I'm thinking of how Heyerdahl wouldn't go hunting with his dad, for example. Yeah, he preferred to learn about nature by listening to his mother read to him. And quite early on, he knew he wanted to become an explorer when he grew up. That came from his camping trips he went on in Norway, I think. No, uh, it was climbing that he spent his time on as a young man. Oh, right. After university, he married a classmate. And together, they decided to experience living on a small island to find out how harsh weather conditions shaped people's lifestyles. As part of their preparation before they left home, they learnt basic survival skills like building a shelter I guess they needed that knowledge in order to live wild in a remote location with few inhabitants, cut off by the sea, which is what they were aiming to do. 
An important part of your talk should be the radical theory Heyerdahl formed from examining mysterious ancient carvings that he happened to find on the island. I think you should finish with that. Okay. Let's now attempt questions 25 to 30, the multiple choice single answer questions. Have a listen. All right, Victor. So after your part, I'll talk about Thor Heyerdahl's adult life, continuing from the theory he had about Polynesian migration. Up until that time, of course, academics have believed that humans first migrated to the islands of Polynesia from Asia in the West. Yes, they thought that travel from the east was impossible because of the huge empty stretch of ocean that lies between the islands and the nearest inhabited land. Yes, but Heyerdahl spent ages studying the cloud movements, ocean currents and wind patterns to find if it was actually possible. And another argument was that there was no tradition of large shipbuilding in the communities lying to the east of Polynesia. But Heyerdahl knew they made lots of coastal voyages and locally built canoes. Yes, or sailing on rafts, as was shown by the long voyage that Heyerdahl did next. It was an incredibly risky journey to undertake. Sometimes I wonder if he did that trip for private reasons, you know, to show others that he could have spectacular adventures. What do you think, Olivia? Well, I think it was more a matter of simply trying out his idea to see if migration from the east was possible. Yes, that's probably it. And the poor guy suffered a bit at that time because the war forced him to stop his work for some years. Yes. When he got started again and planned his epic voyage, do you think it was important to him that he achieve it before anyone else did? Uh, I haven't read anywhere that that was his motivation. The most important factor seems to have been that he used only ancient techniques and local materials to build his raft. Yes. I wonder how fast it went. Well, it took them 97 days from South America to the Pacific Islands. Hmm. And after that, Heyerdahl went to Easter Island, didn't he? We should mention the purpose of that trip. I think he sailed there in a boat made out of reeds. No, that was later on in Egypt, Olivia. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, what he wanted to do was talk to the local people about their old stone carvings and then make one himself to learn more about the process. I see. Well, what a great life. Even though many of his theories have been disproven, he's certainly left a lasting impression on many disciplines, didn't he? To my mind, he was the first person to establish what modern academics call practical archaeology. I mean, that they try to recreate something from the past today, like he did with his raft trip. It's unfortunate that his ideas about where Polynesians originated from have been completely discredited. Yes, right. Well, I'll prepare a PowerPoint slide at the end that acknowledges our sources. I mainly used the life and work of Thor Heyerdahl by William Oliver. I thought the research methods he used were very sound, although I must say I found the overall tone somewhat old-fashioned. I think they need to do a new revised edition. Yeah, I agree. What about the subject matter? I found it really challenging. Well, it's a complex issue. I thought the book had lots of good points. What did you think of... How did you go? I'll now show you the answers. Feel free to go back and listen to the audio again if you need to. Here are the answers for section 3. They are 21 B 22 C 23 D 24 E 25 A 26 C 27 C 28 A 29 B 30 A. As I mentioned, this section is a little bit more challenging than section 1 because the questions are less detail-oriented. Let's now look at section 4, which is usually an academic lecture. You'll see that there are some similarities between this section and section 1. Of course, it'll be more challenging than the first section because, as you know, the test gets progressively more difficult. Don't worry if you feel daunted by section 4 at first. You'll probably find that there's a lot of unfamiliar vocabulary. But that's okay because you don't need to understand every word to understand the questions. And remember, you only need to focus on the information specific to the questions themselves. Now, I said that section 4 is similar to section 1, and this is because it's a note completion task. 
We'll review the method we used in section one, and we'll also add a few more strategies. Be sure to understand the instructions. In this case, you can only write one word for each answer. Read the title and headings. These help you to know where to look and what information to expect. Skim read everything on the page quickly. Look for keywords and, as with section one, look for clues to tell you whether the answer will be a singular noun, a plural noun, a verb, an adjective, or an adverb. Try and predict the answer. Make an educated guess. In section four, you need to look at all the questions before the audio starts. There's no break for reading partway through as there is in the other sections. The computer delivered test will show all 10 questions, but in the paper delivered tests, the last questions may be over the page. There are always 40 questions in total. Listen to the audio and try answering questions 31 to 36. So what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called ethnography. This is a type of research aimed at exploring the way human cultures work. It was first developed for use in anthropology, and it's also been used in sociology and communication studies. So what's it got to do with business, you may ask? Well, businesses are finding that ethnography can offer them deeper insight into the possible needs of customers, either present or future, as well as providing valuable information about their attitude towards existing products. And ethnography can also help companies to design new products or services that customers really want. Let's look at some examples of how ethnographic research works in business. One team of researchers did a project for a company manufacturing kitchen equipment. They watched how cooks use measuring cups to measure out things like sugar and flour. They saw that the cooks had to check and recheck the contents because although the measuring cups had numbers inside them, the cooks couldn't see these easily. So a new design of cup was developed to overcome this problem, and it was a top seller. Another team of ethnographic researchers looked at how cell phones were used in Uganda, in Africa. They found that people who didn't have their own phones could pay to use the phones of local entrepreneurs. Because these customers paid in advance for their calls, they were eager to know how much time they'd spent on the call so far. So the phone company designed phones for use globally with this added feature. Ethnographic research has also been carried out in computer companies. In one company, IT systems administrators were observed for several weeks. It was found that a large amount of their work involved communicating with colleagues in order to solve problems, but that they didn't have a standard way of exchanging information from spreadsheets and so on. So the team came up with an idea for software that would help them to do this. In another piece of research, a team observed and talked to nurses working in hospitals. This led to the recognition that the nurses needed to access the computer records of their patients no matter where they were. This led to the development of a portable computer tablet that allowed the nurses to check records in locations throughout the hospital. Occasionally, research can be done even in environments where the researchers can't be present. For example, in one project done for an airline, respondents used their smartphones to record information during airline trips in a study aiming at tracking the emotions of passengers during a flight. Let's now try questions 37 to 40. Again, I'll give you 30 seconds to skim read before the audio plays. So what makes studies like these different from ordinary research? Let's look at some of the general principles behind ethnographic research in business. First of all, the researcher has to be completely open-minded. He or she hasn't thought up a hypothesis to be tested, as is the case in other types of research. Instead, they wait for the participants in the research to inform them. As far as choosing the participants themselves is concerned, that's not really all that different from ordinary research. The criteria according to which the participants are chosen may be something as simple as the age bracket they fall into, or the researchers may select them according to their income, or they might try to find a set of people who all use a particular product, for example. But it's absolutely crucial to recruit the right people as participants. As well as the criteria I've mentioned, they have to be comfortable talking about themselves and being watched as they go about their activities. Actually, most researchers say that people open up pretty easily, maybe because they're often in their own home or workplace. So what makes this type of research special is that it's not just a matter of sending a questionnaire to the participants. Instead, the research is usually based on first-hand observation of what they're doing at the time. But that doesn't mean that the researcher never talks to the participants. 
However, unlike in traditional research, in this case it's the participant rather than the researchers who decides what direction the interview will follow. This means that there's less likelihood of the researcher imposing his or her own ideas on the participant. But after they've said goodbye to their participants and got back to their office, the researcher's work isn't finished. Most researchers estimate that 70 to 80% of their time is spent not on the collecting of data, but on its analysis, looking at photos, listening to recordings and transcribing them, and so on. The researchers may end up with hundreds of pages of notes, and to determine what's significant, they don't focus on the sensational things or the unusual things. Instead, they will try to identify a pattern of some sort in all of this data and to discern the meaning behind it. This can result in some compelling insights that can in turn feed back to the whole design process. How did you go? It's certainly more difficult than section one. The language is more complex. But remember that you can still get a good score even if you only get a few questions in this section correct. Let's look at the answers. Attitude or attitudes. Numbers, time or minutes. Software, patience, emotions, income, comfortable, observation, and analysis. If you didn't get all the answers, don't worry. It's good to have problems and make mistakes here. This is practice. It's a part of your learning journey. Every correct answer in section four is a success, a step on the way to achieving the result you need. There is bound to be a few stumbles along the way. All of the answers are reasonably common words that you might encounter in everyday life, but some of them, such as analysis, may pose a challenge with spelling. Quite often, students get the correct answer, but it's marked wrong because they misspell it. Does that ever happen to you? The key to improving in all aspects of English, including spelling and listening, is focused and intentional practice. If you need more IELTS help, don't forget to head to e2testprep.com and sign up for an IELTS course. And remember to download the free additional IELTS listening practice questions from the description below. So that's it for today's session. It's good to practice sections of the IELTS listening test and to work on improving specific skills and strategies. Keep up the great work.